Hi everyone. Hi. My name is Kanan and um, as you can probably tell, I come from a land far, far away, several water bodies away, Mystic River, Charles, mouth of the Charles River, and the Inner Harbor. I live in East Boston. <laughs> and I am from India, and if you want any sage advice, uh, spiritual stuff that you want to take away, you can just talk to me later. I'm kidding. <laughs> but I am happy to tell you what to do. <laughs> so this is Eastie Farm, a little space with a big idea in East Boston. And I'll tell you how it came about. This is on my walk from the Maverick T Station on the Blue Line to my home where I live in, in Jeffreys Point area of East Boston. It used to be this abandoned space where weeds were growing and they were growing so far out they'd come into the sidewalk and people walk around it. And of course if it's an abandoned space, you know nobody cares for it, so you don't care for it either. You throw stuff. You know, as people who live in America we're always carrying trash with us, right? You just <laughs> drink something, there's you know, you got something with you. Eat something, there's plastic or whatever. And you don't want to carry it throw it somewhere. And if you see a space that nobody cares for, it's a perfect place to throw it. So we try and get more and more trash cans, but still, you know, there's, there's so much trash that we all carry. We have to abandon it somewhere. So that used to end up in that space. And it's people throwing trash also because people put it in their trash bags and then the trash pickers go through them and the wind does the rest of the work. So there's m many reasons why trash ends up there. So we went to the city and said, this is a city owned space. And let me see if I can, yeah, on this, um, you probably see right there. Is my cursor visible there? Yeah. So right there on the gate. This was how the space was before. It actually looks kind of green, but this is the kind of invasive, unwanted kind of weed for the most part. It's Japanese, not weed for those of you who understand that. So that little green thing there on the gate is a ticket. This, it turns out the city gives tickets to itself. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe it, but it, to this day they still do that. If there are too many 311 calls and that department, say let's say it's Parks Department, hasn't attended to those calls, then the city will find the Parks Department. <laughs> and if they don't pay it, what do they do? Put, put themselves in jail? <laughs> I don't know. But, but um, so EC Farm was started a long time ago in August of 2015. And that's when they gave us the permit. When we asked in March or April, and it took them a while, as it does with governments. And in July, they gave us the permission, a temporary permit to use it until the end of the year. So, yeah, perfect timing, right? Like, when the growing season is ending, that's when you get like a space to grow something. <laughs> so, so we were like, okay, we'll do what we can. And we went in there, and there was a lot of cleanup to do. It's contaminated soil, of course, so it has lead everywhere. Once you detect lead somewhere, you want to be careful. It could be anywhere, and the lead doesn't move around. So the only thing to do is bring clean soil and uh, put it in raised beds and, and grow whatever you want to grow. But we also decided that we want to eventually be able to use the soil to grow things. So we started sheet mulching, growing, uh, putting organic stuff on the soil at, and as time goes on, maybe three, four years, we'll have a few inches of soil. As we keep doing that, we hope to bury the lead and have enough good topsoil to grow stuff in. So that's kind of what we've been doing. We started that right from the beginning, and that itself took a long time. And people were like, where's your garden? Well, we're still sheet mulching. Because we don't want kids to come in there and be exposed to the lead, and we don't want pregnant mothers to have that risk. So that's what we did first, made the soil safe. But within When's Halloween? October, right? End of October. So between August and October, we were able to achieve quite a bit of what they call activating the streetscape. People showed up. You see kids playing outside, and there's a whole lot going inside as well, people just being active. And this is what we call a community farm. The paradigm is different from a community garden where everybody gets an individual piece of real estate, and then you lock it, and everybody else goes on a waiting list. Right? That's not the model here. This is the model 
where it's open all day, every day to everybody, but there are Saturday work days where people come in and work together on whatever they want to do. As you heard, some people actually like to weed. No? So, so then, knock yourself out, do the weeding. There's a lot of weeding to do. The Japanese knotweed is, is so invasive and it used to grow in, in volcanic soil. So it's extremely resilient. You can grow through your pot and, and it, it would just look for where, where nice soil is and just travel over there and come up. It's just the, it's the craziest thing, the Japanese knotweed. And it's all over um, the city, probably in other parts of greater Boston as well. So controlling that itself is, uh, takes a long time and some people like that. They just chase the root. I call them Japanese knotweed warriors. <laughs> <laughs> So they do that. People like to water, and they water. People work together in self-organizing systems to, to figure out what needs to be done and do it. That way people are also meeting neighbors, and we're never going to feed East Boston with the amount of food that we grow there. But really, what, we're, what we say is we're growing food, but we're building community. And we're in the, in the front lines of climate change, as you can tell. We're right on the coast. We're surrounded by Chelsea Creek and, and Charles River, and then, of course, the Inner Harbor. And we've seen two of the highest water levels in the harbor this past winter. That's been ever recorded. And the flood does come into East Boston, the neighborhood. And you may have seen on CNN somebody kayaking yeah. in East Boston. Right? So that person is from Boston Climate Action Network. We just wanted to make a spectacle out of that so that we get attention. <laughs> but it is certainly possible when, it, when the next flood, you know, you've got a kayak come over. <laughs> So a, a few different things going on here. So this is a nice little spot in the back of the little space that we have. There's mulberry tree. What do people do with mulberry trees? They say, oh, it's so messy. It just drops these fruits. We, we don't understand what that fruit is. And it just, when people walk on it, and it just is messy. So what, what should we do? Cut the tree down. No mess. <laughs> you know, that's... That's the understanding a lot of people have. This mulberry is so sweet. For a little bit of this, you pay $10 for that in Whole Foods. But you, you can harvest it all day, at least in June. And, and it's, it's, it's a, such a tasty food. So what we did was we, we started harvesting mulberry and giving it to neighbors so they appreciate what they have. And we also asked the neighbor whose who's lot the tree is actually in to not cut it down. And we, have, we created a little platform to put the shed on because you know, the, the soil was not, the land was not quite flat. So we, we had to create a platform to put the shed on. But as soon as we created the platform, a bunch of young people showed up and started playing music. So, <laughs> yeah, the stage. So then the, we, we put the shed off to the corner, it's not complaining. <laughs> and, and the people are happy. But, but that platform is also where you see this nice, easy setup where you can come and relax during the dog days of summer, and it's like 10, 15 degrees cooler. It's so nice. And there's flowers, butterflies. It's, it's great. And uh, you should check it out this summer. So when people play music and do all kinds of things, it really is to get together and grow community. We give seedlings. We figured out that if you just give seedlings, people don't really grow them then so they need pots they need soil they need some support as to how to grow it you give them the complete solution then they'll do it and the same we do the same thing with waste management we have compost bins don't tell the city of boston <laughs> but people are allowed to bring food scraps and we show them how to compost there's a wood shop nearby in the shipyard they have to pay for their sawdust to be hauled away we take it from them for free and sawdust, what is it? It's carbon, right? And you need as much carbon as possible to, to do your composting. You need the right combination of nitrogen and carbon. Sawdust is our carbon. It's also good because you put your nasty looking smelling food scraps in there and then you cover it up nicely with sawdust. You got carbon, it doesn't look bad, there are no flies, it doesn't smell bad, and it cooks well. <laughs> so once people understand all this, they do it properly. We've never had any complaint from neighbors. In fact, our compost bins are full. And the city has its own compost program, which is a pilot program. It's a nice name, Oscar. But 
not doing so well because of the lack of community engagement. So we're trying to partner with the city to show how this can be done. And our, our combos bins are full. So that means something is working here. People are doing the right thing. And so waste management. We also do rainwater harvesting from the neighbors. When we got in there, we found out that the neighbor next door hadn't put his downspout up after a storm destroyed it because he doesn't, you know, he has a back problem or whatever. We, we asked him, we'll fix it for you. He said, oh, please. And, and we did that. And the rainwater, we collect the rainwater. He doesn't get any water damage. No chronic water damage. No flooding during extreme weather situations. Instead, um, they get some vegetables from us because we get their water in the garden, use, the, use the, that water instead of city water, and then they get uh, the vegetables back. The neighbor next door saw that, and he, he did it himself. He just found an extension for his downspot. Take my water, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he, yeah, he stands outside his fence and says, where's my vegetable? So you know, we give him stuff. Um, so, and, and we have partnered with a lot of organizations, and then Quinton from Green Cambridge came over and, have, and helped us set up a great rainwater management system along with overflow management system because we collect so much rainwater and that is still working very well, Quinton. Thank you. And, and so, um, and when people show up to, to see all this waste management, rainwater harvesting, and how retaining open spaces, open space is good as a climate resilient system because you know, open space knows how to send the water down to the ground. And we need to be recharging our groundwater all the time. Since sea level is rising, we're so close to the sea, we have to be matching, otherwise there'll be infiltration from salt water. So people understand all that, but what helps is that they are among neighbors, among friends, in a green situation with flowers and food and all that. So that positive setting, that context, is helpful to learn all these lessons in. Otherwise, you sit people down like this, and you lecture at them, and the technical stuff doesn't go down that well. <laughs> but instead, say, hey, you're harvesting rainwater. We can see that, and that's a good thing, because they don't get flood, flood damage, water damage, and you get water for free. They can see that. And waste management, same thing. The kids who come, they like to play with the worms. They name every worm, believe it or not. I don't know how they recognize each worm. I think they're lying. But, <laughs> but they learn about waste management. And they say, oh, it's great that our food scraps don't have to get into the trash can, go somewhere. All that mileage that we're adding, all that carbon we're adding, cut it down, source your food locally, process your waste locally, create soil, use that soil to grow more food. So when they understand that cycle can be all local, it's so much better. And most of the problem we have today is because we don't understand our impact, right? How much waste we produce or how much we consume. We don't really understand it. We operate inside these small bubbles of thought horizons where we think, oh, we're living good lives, but we're not. We're just destroying, as, as we know. So, but, but knowing that simple cycle makes it easier for people to understand and control the impact that they're having on the ecosystem. So this has led to a lot of recognitions. City of Boston gave us the Greenovate Award for community engagement. That was just the following year after we started. And, um, we had to plant garlic because they, because remember, they only give us te temporary license until the end of the year. But if you plant garlic, you can say, hey, we can't harvest until next year. So then <laughs> we, can, so we made it a habit and we plant garlic every year. <laughs>so we were invited to because there's so much climate resiliency talk that goes on it's it's a garden so you can say oh i'm just doing a garden i'm not doing any activism so um <laughs> that it works but what people do eventually realize there's some climate resiliency talk and education going on here so um trust for public land understood that and they invited us to give a speech about climate smart cities how spaces like this can be used for to, to do um not only waste management and water conservation, but also so mitigation of urban heat island effect. Yes. So, so I mean, they wanted us to highlight all those points. And some of the people you see here are from a halfway house that's nearby another space that we manage. 
and they, they do all their work indoors. They were just so happy to come out and have a little garden therapy, and we get free labor, so it works well. And, and, uh, and, and they, they're loving it, and they, they learn a lot from it, and uh, they think, and a couple of them have said that they may just go on and do more gardening once they graduate from the halfway house. Kids come as well, and we also touch upon technology. We talk about hydroponics, things like that, because we talk about climate change, and then we think about the eventualities of what may happen if you don't have enough soil to grow food in. So hydroponics comes in, and we show them little solar panels, how they can operate panels uh, to pump water. Um, so I think a few different things um, that kids learn. They also get their soil hands dirty. They, they do want to do that. There's one kid that comes over, he's actually allergic to dust, but he loves being there, and he's just constantly digging stuff. That's what he likes. And um, so every now and then, he, he has like a reaction. And, and mom com comforts him, and she says to me, can you get him to do something else? And I say, okay, Eli, come, come with me. I'm going to show you, do, show you something else that's going to be exciting. He says, OK, as long as it's digging. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I can do. <laughs> so the various schools have come in. One of the things that we've realized is that we, we have to get the young people involved. It's all about the future, and we're, we're sowing seeds of the future, and they are, in fact, the seeds of the human civilization's future. So they should be right along with this plan and directing some of the work. So the many schools that are nearby constantly show up, and they do work. And in the winter, we. We make a soup with the herbs that we collected and dried, and we bring it to this program called Taste of East Tea. And you should check it out when, when you can. It, it happens in February in East Boston. All East Boston restaurants show up and give a sample for people to try. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, once you get in, it's free, but I think there's a ticket. So, <laughs> we also do seed starter events with the library, and People love that. We, we sell seedlings and, um, on a sliding scale. And what else? So there's biodiversity. There's plenty, <laughs> both above ground and below ground. We try to document some of those, give that as exercise to photographers or uh, artists in the neighborhood. So you see some pictures here. Of course, they have a role to play. They're pollinators. They bring bees. Now, all kinds of insects. I think I even saw a snake once. So we go, we get out of the space a little, and there is an orchard that we have, urban wild, where there are apples, and the apples get wasted because they roll down the hill and get crushed by cars. So we, we go and, and shake the tree, collect the apples, and bring them to the soup kitchen. So most, most of the produce goes to food insecure sections of the population. The soup kitchen, there's a family shelter, and there's a food pantry in the church. Volunteers also collect some. We, we do sampling right at the farm as we're harvesting it a little. So that's the view of uh, that's the view of Pierce Park from I was the one up on the tree. I like to do that and shake the apples down. So um, that's the view of Pierce Park from atop the apple tree in the, in one of our urban wilds. So that's people harvesting. This is us in the soup kitchen bringing vegetables, greens, and apples and this is more of the that was more of the taste of east tea happening in east boston i, I think i'll stop there thank you